This is PJ Souls, and you are totally listening to Without Your Head Horror Radio. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by my guest tonight, Connor Frazier, uh, director of the upcoming documentary The Babysitter. And um, you know, right away for people who who might not know um, what that is about or uh, or your name or anything, uh, give them an idea of what this documentary is going to be about. Um, the Babysitter is about Nathan Forrest Winters, who is a uh, former child actor. Um, he was in Something in the Basement and Clown House. Uh, both were directed by Victor Salva, who went on to do Jeepers Creepers. Um, Nathan was molested for six years by Victor, and his career kind of went in the toilet afterwards. Um, his like, Victor's Hollywood people, whatever you want to call them, um, kind of blacklisted Nathan and He's coming out now, you know, it's been 30 years and he's ready to talk about it and to start raising awareness about pedophilia in the industry as well as everywhere else. So Mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. See, that's that's something I didn't know about, though, is the blacklisted part. Um, So that was the documentary. And why was he blacklisted? Is is this more than um, an isolated incident? Is is it something that uh, is prevalent in, in Hollywood? Oh, it's very prevalent. It's very prevalent. Um, there was actually a documentary that just came out uh, two years ago called An Open Secret, which talks about it. Um, it, it. It's happened ever since, I guess, the dawn of Hollywood. And Nathan, it, it certainly wasn't isolated. You know, a, a lot of people, there's misinformation saying it was a, one, a one-time inappropriate touching thing. And it really wasn't. He knew Victor for six years. And this happened for six years. Um, but of course that's not something that really came up, especially in the trial. Um, Victor really got off pretty easily. Um, also on a total of 11 counts, he was only charged with four, Well, he was only convicted on four and he ended up serving 18 months out of a three year sentence in a rehab facility out in Napa Valley. No prison mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And, that's insane. Yeah. To, you know, to think, and then goes, and then goes back to, uh, and making films. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had a film deal waiting for him when he got out. I think the first thing he did after the incident was in 1991. Mm-hmm. So not too, no, not too long after. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he said it, uh, it was over a six-year period. He was uh, 12 when he did Clown House. So was it from the ages of 6 to 12? Yes. Yeah, it was. He had met... Victor became involved with his family um when he was six his victor most of his jobs before he became an established director were ymca daycare stuff like that and he had met nathan's mother and he knew that nathan's mother dabbled in crafts and had asked her to design some props for a short film he was doing i can't remember the name of it but um that's how he became you know, involved with the Winters family and soon enough it became, well, you know, let me take, you know, Nathan out, you know, I'm a babysitter. I can watch him. You know, you guys need a break, stuff like that. And he just, he became a family friend early on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, how, how did he find, um, Nathan to begin with at six years old? Were, were they taking him like on, uh, uh, trying to get him in films? I'm not positive. Uh, as far as I know, it was through that connection with Nathan's mother, with Victor asking Nathan's mom to design some props. And then he just be kind of kind of became aware of Nathan. I, I don't know if Nathan was going. I, I'm not sure where Victor was working at that point because he worked mm-hmm. literally. He had all kinds of different jobs all around children. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it just I noticed when you mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Are, are yeah. there any incidents uh, from any of his uh, former uh, work, even if things he wasn't um, found guilty of? Was there any anyone ever say anything or accuse him of anything um, before uh, this one? Nathan's mother put in a police report, and they raided Victor's house, and Victor was completely unaware of it. So they found. Mm-hmm photo books where he had taken images of young boys from newspaper articles or, you know, clothing ads 
Um, he had photos and videos of Nathan showering. Um, and there was also another young boy, Brian McHugh, who was in Clown House. They found um, video of, but he has never come forward. Mm-hmm. That, that how how do you know Nathan? One. I met Nathan... I, I, I found him on Facebook. I had known about the story and I kind of just came up to him and said, Hey, I've got this idea. And we talked about it and we just kind of came to, I guess he saw something in me. I mean, this isn't the first time this has come up for him, but I guess something in me, he saw different and he decided to pursue my idea as opposed to others. Um, mm-hmm. His biggest thing has always been, he doesn't want to sell out. He doesn't want this to be like a, you know, Betty Davis, you know, mommy did this, mommy did that, you know, Joan Crawford, whatever. He didn't want it to become an expose. Um, Mm -hmm. He just wanted to have the story out there because it never really was. He was never given a voice. Nathan is like this anonymous figure and there's really nothing said about him online. Even if you look up the case, Mm -hmm. all we really know is he's a little 12 year old boy that disappeared. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's really ready um, for, you know? Mm-hmm. At the time, do you and, know, I know she covered it in the documentary, but I'm sorry to talk over you. I was just wondering, um, at the time when you mentioned he was blacklisted, did, did anyone like, uh, offer him anything to, you know, keep quiet at the time or the family? No, as far as he's told me, um, they were never offered to keep quiet. Um, at that point there, there was really no option because when Nathan, finally told his mother it it was a process nathan Mm -hmm. his family did not know until crew members on clown house began to say something they began to say oh well you know doesn't that seem a little odd you know nathan runs up and you know sits on victor's lap after he yells cut you know isn't that odd and so nathan's mother kind of just started pressing him and pressing him and finally he said yes this has been happening it's been six years and she immediately went and filed a police report. So there was really no time to try to hush it up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it went directly you said, into um, the hands of Wall. Yeah. Um, well, you were talking about uh, meeting him online. And um, whose idea was the documentary? Was it your idea? Yeah, it was my idea. And we kind of started, we brainstormed. You know, I told him from the beginning, I want this to be yours. And I think my first the first thing I said was I want this to be almost like a therapy session. I want you to be able to get everything out and I want the audience to feel very personal, you know, it make it very mm-hmm. personal so the audience feels like they're in the room with you. And I think you liked that. And we just moved from there. You know, we, we talked about how we would go about it, what we would do, you know, what we would discuss. And at the end of the day, it's not even about, you know, it's not like a, let's all demonize Victor. Let's go, you know, pitchforks and everything like that. It's really just getting the story out there and doing something positive with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you say something positive um, uh, for Nathan himself, but I would assume also uh, for people in similar, similar situations, they could, uh, you know, relate to him and and see um, different things from one, not to be ashamed to tell someone and, and that your life could go on and you can do other things. Absolutely. You know, and Nathan, he's really taken that on as his own, you know, battle. Um, he was really one of the first, you know, this is the late eighties. Pedophilia wasn't really talked about, you know, child abuse wasn't really talked about until around the time he came out. And so he was really one of the first. So he takes that very seriously and he takes a lot of pride from that. And mm-hmm. that's really the biggest goal for him is to raise awareness and to allow people to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, w- did you try to get anyone else involved or did you primarily want it to be his story? We've so far we have gotten, um, I've talked to his mother. I've talked to his aunt. Um, we have a small team. There's a tight knit team working on this and that's what we've wanted from the beginning. You know, we, we didn't want this to become a thing where we would end up at risk, of, you know, with the media. You know, we wanted this to be ours. And if the media wanted to latch on to it, we would have control over that. We did not want this to become, a, you know, 
a complete nightmare where, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? You know, it, it's Nathan's. And so we're working together with his family, you know, and it's very tight knit, very close. Um, mm-hmm. But I haven't really started working on outside people yet. Um, I've gotten some names, different people who knew Victor, um, but I haven't gotten a hold of them yet. No. Yeah. Has anyone um, uh, from Victor's side contacted you at all about uh, anything? Yes. Um, I had a, a friend of Victor's got a hold of me and we started talking and he's a great guy. Um, he, he seems like he's kind of torn, you know, because he's very close to Victor, but he also feels like Nathan deserves to have this story told. And so we've kind of had to keep it at arm's length because you never know what's going to get to Victor. Um, but that's really been the biggest thing so far. Victor has not spoken about it. As far as I know, he has no clue it's even happening yet. Yeah. That's interesting though, that, that someone close to him would contact you, um, and not just be, you know, telling you, Hey, don't do this or something, but actually is, uh, uh, would want Nathan's story out there too. Yeah, it's interesting. It's definitely, he's definitely, definitely an interesting guy and it was unexpected. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It, um, what, why was Nathan's uh, story so, uh, like, uh, important to you? I think it, it's something that's run through Hollywood. You know, I've always been a movie guy, you know, I started, you know, I got into movies when I was four and it, you know, it runs in my veins. And I know about different stories. You know, one of my idols, you know, is Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin had sex with, you know, 15-year-olds. You know, it's the weird balance between the artist and their personal life. You know, Roman Polanski, people like that. You know, I love The Ninth Gate. It's one of my favorite films. Um, I, I think with Victor, it was more, you know, I came to a point about a year or two ago where originally it was, I'm going to go to Hollywood. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And then it became, well, why, why don't I just do stuff on my own? You know, I, I fell in love with the Blair Witch Project and that movie kind of cemented it in my brain that the way for me that felt most fulfilling is the very hands-on. And Victor is one of those guys. He's one of those heroes, you know, who has, you know, all of his stuff is relatively independent. So, I think that's where it came from for me was that this is a hero, you know, and he did this terrible thing and I wanted to explore that, you know, I wanted to explore it and I wanted to explore it in Nathan's own words because that's never, that's never been a thing for him. Mm -hmm. So when you found that out, how does that affect your view on, uh, on Victor's movies? They, they actually fascinate me now, you know, because, something that you'll notice and it's something we're going to bring up in the film and we're going to actually analyze some of his work in the film because during the trial they had a psychologist come in who found i think maybe 30 references to pedophilia in something in the basement which was Mm -hmm. the first was a short film that he had done with nathan um and i think there were even more in clown house i know the first 15 minutes of clown house you'll see Nathan has a nightmare or something. It's hard, you know, it's really, it's a weird opening, but he wakes up and he pisses his pants and then he takes his underwear off, goes back to sleep. Next morning, his brother is waking, you know, the other siblings up, um, walks in on the older brother masturbating and then walks into Nathan's room where we get to see Nathan's bare ass for, um, at least 30 seconds. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, They've become, and that's something I talked about with Nathan, was that it was, there's these weird subliminal things, these little shots that you'll see, these little trigger moments where you kind of notice this is odd, you know, this is not normal. I mean, look at Jeepers Creepers 2. Jeepers Creepers 2 consists of a group of boys um, trapped in a bus, a group of high school, you know, jocks trapped in a bus while a monster walks up and down the top, you know, on top of the roof, you know. That was very predatory, you know, to me. 
and it just made knowing what I know now, it just makes all of Victor's films fascinating because he he isn't shy about it. He he I think he works out his sexual, you know, proclivities. I, I think he works that out in his films. Mm-hmm. Not to say that it's not awful, but that you can't help but be fascinated by it at the same time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I think some people so, have a hard time yeah. with, uh, just real quick, and then you go back to your story, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. about um, finding something that is awful, also interesting. Um, it doesn't mean that you're for that, or you think it's, uh, or you excuse it in any way, but it's still something that is there, and it, it, it can interest you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, yeah, and I was just you know going to say that at the end of the day, do I, you know, do I hate Victor's work? Do I not credit him as an artist? Well, no, I credit mm-hmm. Victor as an artist. I just don't. The biggest issue I think we've got, you know, 30 years on for Nathan is there's never been an apology. There's never been, he's never owned up to it. Mm-hmm. When powder was released, Nathan came back around during powder. Um, which was a film Victor did in the mid nineties. Yeah. Um, he came back around because his biggest issue was Buena Vista, who's, you know, owned by Walt Disney had made the film mm-hmm. or it was under their banner. And he said that right there, that's what's wrong. You know, that that's, I, I don't mind the fact that Victor's working. I just don't think, you know, why in the hell is Disney doing it? Right. Um, and Nathan released a statement where he said, you know, I have paid for my crimes dearly, you know, this kind of this pity pot thing. And mm-hmm. I think that's the agitating part that if there's going to be any real criticism of Victor, it's not the fact that he's working and it's not whether or not he should be working or what his work is about. It's the fact that he has never come out as an adult, you know, a grown man and said, look, I did this, you know, and I'm trying to move on. Um, from the very beginning, um, in the court case, you know, Victor, you know, he tried with all his might to get the easy way out and he got it. And he's continued to do that. He's continued to refuse to face the fact that that's what he did. And at the end, this film is not about, you know, crapping all over his legacy or anything. It's just about, you know, if Victor is so rehabilitated, why does, why does he refuse to take responsibility? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I have my own theory on uh, the rehabilitation of uh, someone who's sexually attracted uh, to children, but what, what are yours? Do you think someone could be rehabilitated from that? I think there's not been enough work done on that. Um, me and Nathan have talked about that And I I always bring up the point that, you know, there are websites, there are online, you know, groups of pedophiles that act like Alcoholics Anonymous. They come together and they try to stop one another from acting on their urges. Mm -hmm. So is it impossible? No. But Mm -hmm. in Victor's case, it's difficult to say just what is going on in his head because he has refused to take responsibility for it. So you really don't know, especially in Hollywood, you can get away with anything. So the question is, you know, has he done it again? Well, you know, who knows? I think that there's a chance, but it starts with recognizing your illness. Yeah. Even what you said there, like an Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the idea of being rehabilitated where, well, what's your, what's your, it's, I guess it comes down to what your definition of rehabilitation is. Would it be just not acting on your impulses or actually not having those impulses? Do you think um, someone think... could be real bit rehabilitated where they couldn't, they just wouldn't have mm-hmm. those impulses or is it more just uh, to stop someone from a- acting on, on those? I think they can be, I think the impulses can be stopped. I mean, there's a lot of things that make a pedophile. And for a lot of people, it's um, having been molested. And if you refuse to work on that issue, you're going to end up, you know, these things are going to bottle up, you know, and they're just going to sit there and sit there. And finally, they're going to have to come out somehow. And I think that was 
I, I think that's most, not most pedophiles, but at least a, a majority of them have been touched themselves. So I don't think for some, it might be inherently, you know, in there, you know, from the beginning, but I, I find that unlikely. I, I think there's always got to be something that triggers that. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's like unlikely that this would ever happen, but would that be something that you'd be interested um, in finding out more about, like uh, uh, Victor's background and his history, his childhood? I, I have delved somewhat into Victor's background. I've delved into what Nathan had told. I mean, Victor had told Nathan. Um, I'm not sure how much of it we're going to be using, um, mm-hmm. but I know that. For him, I think he could easily be rehabilitated if he wanted to be. Mm-hmm. But I just don't think, from what he has shown, he has not shown an interest in being rehabilitated. He has not shown an interest in giving back at all. Mm-hmm. He just wants to wipe it under, you know, under the rug and move on. And for for Nathan, you know, for Brian McHugh, I imagine, you know, for the countless others whom we suspect. Nathan has dug into it a little more, and he suspects there's at least, I think, a dozen of children who are molested by Victor. Wow. So until yep. all of that comes out, mm-hmm. and until Victor's ready to accept that, I don't think there's going to be rehabilitation on his end. Mm-hmm. And um, how, much is, um, how much has this affected... Nathan's life. I know we talk about he's blacklisted from acting or, you know, gave up acting, but, you know, uh, some being molested affects your life, uh, in every level, you know, way beyond just, you know, if you're going to be an actor or not. Every level, every level. Mm-hmm. Um, Nathan, Nathan's a fighter and Nathan has fought for 30 years to stay alive. You know, the, one of the first things he said to me, you know, when we first started talking, I think it was our first phone call. And he said, Connor, don't think I have never tried to kill myself because I have, you know, don't think mm-hmm. that this hasn't, don't think that I, you know, I'm lucky to be here. And I think that that's, that has given him new meaning. I think is that he's looking at it and saying, I was this close to being dead. Now, what am I going to do with what I've got? And he, I know, there's a per- certain part of his back he can't be touched on. Um, I know that it's affected his relationships with friends, women. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's been hell for him, and it's not even just Victor. You know, he was raped by a friend of his when he was 15. It's mm-hmm. like been this never-ending struggle where it just keeps popping up, and somehow or another he's fought through that. Um. He's, you know, he's yeah. drugs, alcohol, everything. Now, um, from what you have been saying, it doesn't seem like you act, you necessarily uh, like hate Victor, um, or, or I don't even know if Nathan does. But I think some people who uh, listen might think, yeah, how how can that be when when you know someone's um, destroyed, you know, a lot of of your life and and taken away things from your life and how how your life goes. And you think they've done that to other people? How do you how do you not hate them, or how do you have sympathy for uh, or for, for Victor? On Nathan's end, I think it's because at the end of the day, he's come to a point where he he feels Victor did not intentionally want to hurt him, but Victor had impulses that were they, they were you know ruling over him. Um he doesn't hate Victor. And that was the first thing that I was really intrigued by. And that was why I wanted to do it. it was because he wanted to go at it. You know, it wasn't an expose that was no. And I love that about Nathan. He's willing to forgive. Um, for me, it's always weird, especially being an artist, you know, because when you're working in film or, you know, writing or whatever, there's, always an amount of emotional, you know, exposure. So you learn to look into people and you learn to recognize their faults and their strengths. And I guess not, not, you know, accept, not tolerate, but 
to understand. Um, I understand Victor's point of view. He wants it to be, you know, over with. He's tired of it being drudged up. And I understand Nathan's point of view. And I think for me, that's been the biggest part of it. That's been the most fascinating part of doing this film is that I get to look at both sides. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm in Nathan's camp completely, but Mm -hmm. I still get to, because I'm an outside party, delve into it more than Nathan would ever want to, I think. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think Nathan would really want to go go into Victor's life and talk to his friends. (laughs) And, you know, for me, it's, yeah. So I, I don't know, you know, it's hard. You, you have to respect the art for what it is. You know, Jeepers Creepers is not a bad film. Um, Clown House is not a bad film. It's not badly done. But what he was doing to his lead was horrific. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, saying that, what are your thoughts on that? There is a petition to uh, boycott Jeepers Creepers 3. Uh, what are your opinions on that? I personally don't, I, I could care less if people watched it. I mean, like I said, you know, if you're able to look at the art on its own merits and that's great. Some people can do that. Some people can't. And that's just not a battle that I think we want to get into because we're me, you know, Nathan, everyone else try to stay out of that aspect of it um i think he's he's been able to be a filmmaker he's been able to do what he loves nothing's going to stop that so i don't see the point in fighting it you know nothing is going to he's cemented himself he's got at least something to call a legacy i don't know what that is but there's something there that will be left behind when he passes so I, I don't think going out there and saying let's not, you know, everybody boycott it. Well, no, it's going to get out there. You know, it's it's already, it's too big. And if you want to watch it, that's great. Like I said, Jeepers Creepers is not a bad film. Um, and Nathan has always said, Nathan has always stressed that as long as there's no minors on set, he could care, he could care less. And I, I'm of that same opinion. I could give two shits less with what Victor does as long as he is kept under, you know, on a leash to some extent, very, you know, and it's very simple. And that's the agitating part of it is that, you know, when Jeepers Creepers was going into production, they called Nathan, the production office, essentially we're just checking to make sure Nathan wouldn't raise hell. And the way he told me, he said, I said, fine, as long as there's no children on set. And they would not give me a straight answer. So I said, well, I can't give you one. And they ended up, I think that was the whole thing with the Canada issue, where it was the film was pulled out of Canada. Mm -hmm. It was going to be filmed there last year. And it was because they wouldn't give him a straight answer. And that's the biggest issue. It's not about whether or not he makes films. It's not about whether or not, you know, should we watch them? Uh, who cares as long as he's following the law mm-hmm. no i really think that says a lot about uh nathan um that uh because it's one thing someone to to look like yourself or, or me or whoever to to look at it and have sympathy for uh for victor and not hate him or whatever but uh someone who's actually directly uh um, involved in it, uh, to, to not have hatred is, uh, I think says a lot about him as a human being. Oh yeah. You know, he's great. And that was what I was so attracted to and why I pursued it is because Nathan, he didn't come out standoffish and he didn't come out wanting blood. You know, he didn't, you know, he wasn't trying to push me away because that's something, you know, that kind of comes up in the myth you know, is that Nathan's never going to want to, he wants to be left alone. And that's not the truth. Nathan doesn't mind. He just is tired of the constant, you know, the ulterior motives that come with it. When people Mm -hmm. say, let's make a movie or let's write a book, but you have to say this, you have to say that. Um, there's still aspects of it, you know, that Nathan struggles with. I mean, he struggles with 
anger naturally when it comes to the issue. You know, it does mm -hmm. piss him off, <laughs> you know, that sure. Victor has refused to take responsibility for it. But yeah, it's never been, let's make sure he never makes a movie ever again. Let's make sure, you know, even with Powder, he protested the premiere. It had nothing to do, but it had everything to do with those people who were, who made it. And that was the mm -hmm. Walt Disney Company. Yeah. The, um, now, did you have to, uh, uh, to get ready for this? Did you, uh, study, um, um, sexual predators and, and, um, and child molesters and see the different patterns? I've looked into different stuff. There's a, um, Victorian book, um, the, I think it's the autobiography biography of Victor X or something. And it's, an anonymous journal of a pedophile. No, I'm not really something he wrote. I think it was a study done on him. Um, and you, you know, you, you study that. And I study a lot of the Hollywood controversy, you know, an open secret. Um, I studied the sexualization of kids in the media. Um, I have a book. I can't remember the name of it, but I sift through it every once in a while. Um, that talks about the kind of the loss of childhood. It's called The Disappearance of Childhood. That's what it's called. And it discusses the loss of childhood you know, in this modern age where kids are growing up faster and faster. Um, and all of that kind of came together. I even looked at like the satanic panic in the 80s, you know, just different stuff. Mm -hmm. How especially I think for me, it wasn't necessarily what creates a pedophile because that's still it's still so misunderstood. But it was more how do we react to pedophiles? Mm -hmm. and it's like the last great taboo next to necrophilia. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. it is. Mm -hmm. And I um, think that's what we are really trying to go after is to stop making it a taboo to start talking mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you say that, uh, you mean to, to talk about it, not necessarily, uh, not, not to condone it. Yeah, no. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I just want to make it sure. Talk I'm about sure. I understood, but I just want everyone to need to know what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, David on uh, the Facebook, he asks, uh, do you have any plans to involve Andrew? Uh, I'm not sure I say last name Vox, uh, with your documentary V A C H S S. I have no clue who he is. I mean, it's for the most part, a lot. It's been like this trail, it starts with Nathan, then it goes to Nathan's family, and then they give me names, and then I have to find those names. And that's still all in the making. You know, right now, I'm trying to work with Nathan's aunt, who mm -hmm. controls most of the paperwork. She has all of the court documents, well, most of them at least, whatever she could salvage in a box. And so she's hunting for that, and we're trying to kind of set up a paper trail and to try to have a chronology that we can go by you know as i start try to develop the story um i haven't really spoke to people for interviews yet outside of the family mm -hmm. um have, has so the far, family yeah, no. been uh, has the family been open uh uh to, to 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 talk about this on camera oh very much very much so yeah um his aunt actually donated a hundred dollars to the campaign last night. Oh, nice. You know, it's been a huge overwhelming support from them. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's insane. They've been itching for this for 30 years, you know, mm -hmm. so that they, they want to help in every way they can. Um, yeah. and that's really great. That's, it's mm -hmm. been fantastic. So, yeah, no, to answer that question, I, I know I haven't gotten a hold of him. Um, I'll need to look into him, you know, or maybe if whoever asked the question can shoot me a message and kind of give me an idea of who that man is, I might want to do it. Yeah. But so far it's been, I haven't even, we've, I've got names, but I haven't right. talked to anybody yet. You're not that far, far along. Yeah. And uh, by the way, uh, there's a link for the GoFundMe page on, on our website and uh, you can find it you know, all different, um, all over uh, Facebook and stuff. But, um, w for people, uh, to understand what does the money go for uh, the, you know, the money goes for, 
yeah, the money goes for traveling. <laughs> it goes towards um, locations, um, lodging, just everything we need. My plan, my hope is to shoot the film in Fort Lee, New Jersey. So we're all trying to set up, you know, Nathan lives on the West Coast. I live on the East. So we're trying to, you know, get everyone together. And that's really the biggest thing is getting everyone together in a room. That's where the money comes in, you know. And, yeah, that's what it is. I mean, it's for locations, for lodging, for airfare, for whatever we need. Um, none of it goes towards us. We have, we, we, none of us so far have made a dime off of it. And no plans have been made to make a dime off of it unless we find a distributor, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. all of this goes strictly toward the fund and we have set up, you know, precautions, you know, we, we really had to make sure that we were doing this correctly because we did not want there to be an issue. We do not want people to think that this is going towards us. It's not some Mm -hmm. kind of vengeance thing, you know, we're, and we're not going to go out and we're, you know, we're not going to go out and use the money to be jackasses. You know, this is all very, very clear, very concise. We had it planned out before we dropped it. You know, we made sure that every everything made sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I wanted to bring so, it up to you because yeah. uh, people know that it's uh, to, to actually make the um, uh, to make the documentary and, uh, and all the expenses. Uh, Crystal Brook uh, says, Connor, there's a great documentary on the mind of offending and non-offending pedophiles it's called is every man a pedophile uh, uh the mm-hmm. title bothered me but after I, I watched it it was great it was uh, great information i myself as a victim study uh the hell out of the stuff and contribute towards public education in my own small ways have you found that e- even yeah have you found that even just uh even before the documentaries like you made or out just uh bringing it up that you, have you been like um, contacted by people that uh, were victims themselves, and uh, you know, and, and, and find this, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Ab- absolutely. Um, it's happening more and more because we started. Um, we took a little money out of our own pockets to advertise the um, the GoFundMe and the charity. I mean, the organization. Uh, Nathan would event. Essentially, like we are their voice to be a charity for now it's focused on it's kind of the umbrella for the film but once the film is over with we'd like to make that a charity but um yeah the, we've been using um you know facebook advertising to try to get that out there and we've gotten so many likes in the last three days and so many messages i'm sure nathan has had more than me i've had a couple of people who have come <laughs> come out and said you know this happened to me i want to help any way possible you know, and I think on that note, you know, that comes up a lot. How can I help? You know, and the only way, you know, so far, the best way is just to donate. We have to have those donations or else this is not going to go anywhere. I mean, if we have to donate, if we have to fund it out of our own pockets, we are completely prepared to go for whatever we do, whatever we have to do to get it made. But our hope mm-hmm. was that this film could be an interpersonal experience, the audience and the creators. Mm-hmm. We want the people nope. w- who are so fascinated by this story, because they have been for years. There's been this fascination with this story. And we mm-hmm. want those people to have their voice in it. You know, to if you want to see this, this is for you. You know, this is for you guys. You know, mm-hmm. so please, please donate, you know. Yeah. Just from uh, your initial um, interest in making this uh, through, you know, talking to Nathan and uh, these other things, has your view of, of documentary would be, has it changed at all? Like, uh, like what you were trying to accomplish with it? It always does. I mean, for me, Mm -hmm. I didn't have, um, yeah, it, it always starts with a little, you know, grain, you know, and you keep, it keeps growing and growing. And it, it's really just grown and grown and grown. I mean, by now, I think I work with everybody. You know, I work with everyone to kind of solidify, you know, is this a story we want to tell? 
and we've all come to the conclusion that we like what we've got. So there's a pretty solid idea now, but, and it didn't take too terribly long, you know, for some things it'll take years. This took a matter of months, you know, where we just, the energy was so, it, it was there, you know, and everything just fell in at the right time. But yeah, it has changed. There's been more, um, more, I, I think we've added more of an energy to it over time. We really want the film to be, we want it to have an energy. We want it to not just simply be a documentary, but we want it to be an experience for people. So I've mm -hmm. been trying to channel a lot of Nathan's energies into it. I've really kind of listening to what he's saying and listening to the way he says it, you know, so I can get an idea of, you know, this is what's going on in Nathan's head. And I want people to experience that. I want people to get into Nathan's head. Mm hmm. Um, and even in the, in the Victor's head, you know, I, I've looked at yeah. both ends. We, we want to do both. We want to get into Victor's head. Mm -hmm. We want to get into Nathan's head. So that's yeah. been fascinating. It's been great. Mm -hmm. um, have, have you talked to, I know you said talk to the family. Have you talked to Nathan's mom? Uh, is she going to be part of it? Yeah. Nathan's Cause... mom, um, I've only just recently started talking to her in the last day or so. But she's expressed a lot of interest in helping in any way she can. Um, in I asked her if she'd like to be interviewed. She had no issue with it. But of course, that's, you know, miles down the road. But yeah, yeah Nathan's mom is involved. Nathan's mom mm -hmm. is. Yeah. That, yeah, I couldn't imagine, you know, there would be. I would think there's so many uh, emotions for her. Uh, you know, you you couldn't not help but feel uh, some guilt, you know, having your your child, uh, you know, end up with with uh, with with with, uh, with Victor and. Um, I don't know. It's just, uh, it, I'm, sh I'm sure that can't be easy for her to talk about or even easy to talk to her about. Oh, it. no. Oh, no, no. I mean, I think by now there's been enough time and the energy is just, you know, it's yeah. grown and grown and everything is just welled up that they're so easy to talk to about it. There's no, you know, n there's no one standoffish. Nobody's, you know, nobody mm -hmm. tries to keep anything. Everybody has just laid it out for me, you know, and that's yeah. been a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just to be realistic, I think um, it would be helpful to uh, other uh, males who were molested because um, there's more of a stigma there to, to be a to be a male and, and talk about being molested by another male. I mean, just to, to be realistic, you know, in the world. Absolutely. And it's what's so funny about that is that throughout history, that boys have been the biggest targets. Uh huh. You know, we, you know, not to say that it doesn't happen. It happens enough. It happens so much to girls and boys. But I mean, look at mm -hmm. ancient history with the Greeks, you know, the amount mm -hmm. of molestation that occurred with young boys. Um, yeah. There's something about, I, I don't know, there's something about young guys that seems to have this prevalent thing. There, there's just this weird, um, it just it's been continual all throughout history um and i think nathan he wants to you know work with everybody you know it's not yeah, about guys or course. girls you know sure. but mm -hmm. i think i think i think there's something to be said for the fact that it seems to be the boys came out first i don't mm -hmm. know why i don't know why the boys came out first and i wish more girls would come out because it isn't yeah. that there aren't enough mm -hmm. girls that come out. So mm -hmm. I don't know. There's just this weird prevalence of boys yeah. versus girls. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the things Nathan has done uh, later in life to, uh, to help other victims? Nathan has mostly, it's been a process for him and he's really had to learn you know, he, he had to figure it out, you know, and it's only been the past couple of months. Babysitter is the culmination of that. You know, that's the, the answer. I think what has Nathan done in later in life? Well, babysitter, you know, that's, this is the beginning. Nathan has become a father. Um, he's been married. Um, he's a musician. Um, and he's never been, you know, against talking about it. People add him on Facebook all the time. You know, are you the kid from Clown House? You know, and he talks about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but he just never, 
I guess until now, never had found or, you know, felt that there was an avenue that was right to getting it out mm-hmm. to, you know, the masses, I guess. Yeah. So do you have any reason? Been, uh, yeah. I'm going, sorry. You're going. I was just saying, do you yeah. think there's any reason why for that? Um, do you think it's just the time was right and you happened to come, come along and, uh, just that's, everything that came together at this says. point in time. Mm-hmm. That's what he says. He says that it was, you know, the, the time period he said in meeting me and the amount of, you know, meeting, you know, several people, you know, there were several people outside of me and, all of us together, I guess, culminated into him finally taking the initiative. I I don't know. You know, I tried to, (laughs) you know, he'll sing me my praises and I'll just blush and say, Oh, well, thank you. You know, I mean, (laughs) what are you going to do? Um, so yeah, I think it is just everything happened at once. Just strangely, mm -hmm. you know, fate. Well, what's your background in, uh, in movies? Um, you want the whole background? <laughs> you sure. want all of it from way yeah. before? Um, yeah, all right. Well, I, I, <laughs> well, we'll go into it. You know, we'll, we'll let everybody get into my head a little bit. Um, <laughs> I I started getting into movies when I was four. Um, I, I watched, there's certain things that kind of attracted me when I was little, you know, stuff like Planet of the Apes, um, Sleepy Hollow, um, Wizard of Oz, but now that's funny because the Wizard of Oz terrifies me now. <laughs> but I was so open to it back then. Uh-huh. Um, and I kind of just, you know, I, I, would, I had little clay models I would create stories out of. I was a big fan of Henry Selleck, you know, James and Giant Peach, Coraline, all that. Um, and he really got me into the animation thing. One day I'd love to do animation, but that was when I kind of started. I started with the clay, you know, and when I was nine, my parents got me a video camera, an old Sony. Um, it looks old now. <laughs> um, and it's around somewhere. I don't know where it is. I got to find it, but it survives. Um, mm-hmm. And I filmed movies on that. I did, you know, a film with my dog called The Adventures of Penelope with my little sister. Um, I did a film where I took live bugs and I did like, it was like Rocky with live bugs. I don't know why. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and then when if they died I just said well I just had to write that into the story you know they died <laughs> um, that sounds hideous I sound like that kid from a toy story <laughs> um, and then it kind of just was that you know I, I did that and then I skipped to 15 or 16 um, I met a guy in high school named um, Lo- 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 Logan Henson Logan Henson and me and him are very close, very close. And we started working on stuff together because he directs just like I do. And we mm-hmm. stopped and started about three different times. And we ended up with this film called no- World of Dogs, which became n- Nothing and Going Nowhere. Um, and we had that screened locally here in Roanoke um, at the Grandin Theater, which is like a historic theater down here or up here, wherever down here down here um and after that i kind of spent some time you know i did adult stuff you know i was turning 18 i grew up a little bit and i just finished a short um about a month ago called american heathens which (laughs) eventually that'll be somewhere (laughs) i'm not sure yet (laughs) but um yeah i mean i've always had a background in it from a very young age, mm-hmm. I've always wanted to do film. Um, Tim Burton, you know, John Crittsalusi, Matt Groening, um, Kenneth Anger, you know, everybody. <laughs> I got a little bit of everybody in me. Um, Eduardo Sanchez has been huge. Um, and he's actually, you know, a great guy. He directed the Blair Witch Project with Daniel Myrick. Um, and we're kind of, you know, we pen pal on Facebook a little bit, not too much. Um, but he's been a great guy. And, you know, he's a big influence and it's nice to be able to talk to some of your heroes and not, you know, them not be assholes, you know, <laughs> it's really been great. Right, right. You know, he, that's always he, a plus. He takes, yeah. my, he takes my questions and that's been, you know, recently his stuff has solidified, 
in me kind of what I want to do, you know, because I started out with the big guys, you know, Tim Burton and everybody else. And Mm -hmm. I still hold Tim Burton very dear to my heart, but it was Blair Witch that started setting me up on this path for low budget. You know, let's do hands on, you know, let's do hands on stuff. Roger Corman, you know, he was huge for me because sure. um, he, you know, he made it work. You know, he made these brilliant, beautiful films with nothing. And mm-hmm. I like that. There's something fun about the torture, I guess, <laughs> of having to make it up all as you go along like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, um, when I talked know, to Tom, you know, I was going to say real quick, when I talk, talked to Tom Savini years ago, he had mentioned he had the most fun when uh, in the early movies because you're uh, – you're just making stuff up as you go along, you know, how, how to, how to make a zombie or how to make these different blood things. And then, uh, later on, oh, yeah. once, uh, it, it becomes, you know, a routine, uh, the fun's not as, as, as much as it was, uh, when you didn't have the money, no. or you didn't know how to, how to do certain things. From, from the age of 11 on, you know, um, Halloween became a big movie for me <laughs> and it was always, you know, it started out with the image, you know, that weird, you know, that face, you know, that entity that was Michael Myers. And, you know, as the years went on, I researched it more and more. And I found, you know, an appreciation for the way that it was done, you know, where it was so hands on and that there was the suggestion. That's what made it scary. Michael's a force of nature. There's no explanation. And the same thing with Blair Witch. The suggestion was more terrifying than anything they could have put on the screen. Um, John Carpenter is another influence for Halloween, you know, um, just, you know, this rambling group of college kids, you know, mm-hmm. they made one of the best films of all time. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, now I, and- that's what I, yeah, I was going to say, I always, the, the remake of Halloween, which I don't think is a bad movie, but I think it misses a lot of what, made the original one so scary. I think it totally misses the point of what makes the the original one so scary. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Halloween. Oh, shit. Uh, uh, That was... I refused to watch Rob Zombie's Halloween, uh, and I actually want to. I've decided uh, this year I'm going to get really drunk, and I'm just going to watch it, and I'm just going to shit all over it. (laughs) I've seen bits and pieces of it, and I mean, that's no disrespect to you. You know, everybody uh, is entitled... uh, to what they like, you know, and I mean that's great. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I'm, I like. I'm not that a people big fan. I'm not a fan. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I think I told you this is the point of uh, what makes the original Halloween. It's uh, it's uh, you don't know what, why he's a killer, and that makes it scary because then it could be a, a kid, uh, in, in yeah. any any neighbor, and uh, and then Loomis exactly. totally sells uh the evilness of him because. Uh, he spent, you know, so many years trying to reach him. Then he realizes he is just evil. And uh, in the remake, it's the opposite. It's uh, it's a kid who's uh, who's bullied and has a bad uh, family. And so it's all kind of spelled out why this kid would turn bad. And uh, that's not nearly as scary. Plus, he's like it's seven not, foot tall. And, yeah. <laughs> and even, you know, in the second one, it just gets worse. It just becomes I, I've seen bits and pieces, but I refuse to watch them in their entirety. Until maybe this Halloween, I might just get really, really shit faced and just talk about it, <laughs> do a commentary, a live stream, and I don't know. Sure. Um, <laughs> but yeah, those guys, you know, and it's weird how those young guys, like Tom, you know, Tom Savini's right. You know, there is, there's just such a magic to it. And I've really tr- applied a lot of that to this, you know, not just because we have to, but mm-hmm. because that's what I want to do, you know. Eduardo Sanchez did a film 2011 called Lovely Molly. And I love Lovely Molly. Um, I told him, I said, look, it's better than Blair Witch. And it's sad that nobody recognizes that. Because Lovely Molly, Ed took the found footage and used it to essentially get into somebody's head. And so you could watch as Molly loses her mind. Through her recording herself, you're, you're witnessing from her point of view, you know, the, the disintegration of her sanity. And I was inspired a lot by that, you know, working on this, you know, cause I wanted to get inside of the heads of, you know, Nathan and Victor. And I want to display this, the fear, you know, the anguish, you know, I want to exp- display all that, you know, and 
so I used a lot of, you know, that, that was a big influence and that's another movie, you know, it's nobody knows about it. It's just kind of there. Um, and I think it, it was in theaters for like a week. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I've not heard but it of was it. just so uh, much better. It's something. Uh, yeah. I'll have to check that out. Sounds uh, interesting. It's, it's so much. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, you know, he built on what he started essentially. And that, that was great. Um, mm-hmm. But the movies like that, you know, movies like that, the kind of the ones that go under the radar, you know, there's a brilliance to a lot of them, you know, and it's mm-hmm. funny how they go under the radar because they are so brilliant, but people don't recognize that. Halloween was the exception. Night of Living Dead was the exception, you know. Mm-hmm. Blair Witch was the exception, but then it's funny. Blair Witch started all this great stuff and then Ed comes out and does something in the same vein, you know, it's the same guy, but nobody's watching it. And so these, these guys really, you know, they're influential on me and they're influential on the babysitter. I think, you know, these not necessarily creating horror, not creating a horror movie out of it, sure. but using the methods mm-hmm. because I think um, in horror movies, there's a, yeah. more fun with it. Sure. Yeah. Cause it's not people real. Take more risk. Right. Yeah. People take more risks. I think for some reason they, they loosen up with horror movies where you can't with a comedy and you can't with the drama. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you're making the documentary, um, now some people have different opinions on what a documentary is. Um, do you want to, sh- uh, not necessarily put your own, uh, opinions or, uh, or agenda at all in, in your documentary and let, uh, you know, the, the, what, what, your showing speak for itself or do you have uh or do you want to include your own personal uh thoughts in the documentary um yes and no i mean there's moments in it you know there's certain things that i've brought up you know that nathan's agreed to that are my touches you know and then there's you know but the majority of it is capturing the feeling, you know, of capturing how Nathan is feeling, capture how Victor was feeling, capture how his family was feeling, um, taking the, that energy and um, translating it to film. Um, we, I, we talked about, you know, we plan to do some kind of, um, we want to do not reenactments, but we want to do little, you know, scenes within the film that kind of, you know, they're just emotions there's scenes almost like something that's surreal, you know, where it's just an emotion, you know, the visuals aren't necessarily what you need to be looking at. Um, that was my biggest thing. And that was hard. That's, it's been hard, you know, developing it because you want to have a balance. You don't want it to be cheesy, you know, and absurd, Mm -hmm. but you still kind of want to fit that in somehow. And I think we've gotten to a point with it, you know, we've brainstormed on it where we're comfortable enough with the combination of the dramatized stuff, the images with the interviews, because that's what we want it to be an experience. Um, we want it to be an experience. We don't want it to be necessarily just a film because it's literally the springboard off of which everything Nathan wants to do is going to come off of, you know, he wants to do speaking tours. He wants to start this charity you know, and all of that kind of lies on the shoulders of the babysitter, you know, yeah. and that's our, our reintro- that's his reintroduction back into, mm. you know, in- entertainment, I guess, after being yeah. gone for so long, you know, and that this is his reintroduction back into the industry and to some extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, some I, that, that must add, that, that would add uh, extra pressure, I, I assume on your part make sure everything goes well <laughs> it, it it it's good i, I think because we we definitely sure, good pressure. we we, kill, we 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 keep each other level um nathan's been very good with me um very good to me um about trying to you know as much as i've been trying to work for him he's been trying to work for me as well and so we take the pressure off of each other and you know um, one of our partners in the, within the production, um, Amber, um, if you're out there, hi, <laughs> um, 
um, she's been huge as well. You know, she's taken a lot of the pressure off of us doing the, you know, the financial stuff, you know, all of the, a lot of the promotion, my end of it is usually the film promotion and she promotes, um, the bigger, we are their voice. Um, but all of that in terms of fundraising is her, you know, she really spearheaded that we're a team, you know, everybody has an equal say. So it's really not hard, you know, not as hard as you would imagine, you know, the pressure because we look at it together. You know, every decision I make goes through Nathan and every decision he makes goes through Amber, you know, so everybody and, you know, just kind of goes in a circle, you know, so that we can all agree on it. Uh, uh, what, what is, we are there. We are still, um, the, the name, we're their the voice the company. We're their voice. I'm sorry. We are, uh, what we are their is voice. It? it is an umbrella term for everything we're doing. Nathan wants to do a speaking tour and he wants, you know, that that's going to be our image. We are their voice. That's what he wants the image to be. The image for, you know, I guess since, you know, we're, you know, funding this through donations and doing self-funding and all of that, you can consider it the babysitter's production company. Um, at the end of the day, he wants it to be a charity. He's hoping that what we're doing now, we're trying to build momentum so people recognize that this is what's happening, that this guy is going out here and he's, he wants to talk about child abuse. And we're hoping that we can begin to create something massive, you know, out of this. So right now it's, it's an image, but hopefully, you know, as time goes on, it could be a charity. It could be, um, a way in which it's, it's almost like Nathan's company. It's what he's associated himself with. It's how he will handle all of it. It's how he wants to handle all of it. I think it's, you know, if we need, you know, donations that go in there once again, would go towards after the film, you know, if, if he continued to ask for donations, it would go towards, you know, well, he needs a tour, he needs a tour bus. He needs some way to get around the country. Um, he needs to be able to get in touch with, um, businesses to get in touch with schools, to get in touch with anybody. And so he's trying to build enough momentum with, we are their voice so that he can go out there and there wouldn't be this hassle of this, this random guy going around talking about child abuse. You know, mm -hmm. he wants, you know, it, it's hard, you know, it's hard to explain because that's his baby, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, and he's still, I think, trying to figure it out, but I know at the end of the day, he wants it to be the kind of like United way. That's the best way to put it like the United way. He wants to, mm -hmm. you know, speaking tours, um, if he want if he wants to do um benefits, anything would go from it would all come out of we are their voice. Um, donations. Mm -hmm. None of it would go towards him, none of it go goes towards me, you know, as I said before. Um, and we're actually, you know, that's something we've been really keeping track of. Um, and we're trying to find anybody, anybody out there who can help us. We're trying to set up a very small group, a core group of people, you know, financial, um, you know, legal representation, um, everything we need so that we can go out here with our, you know, heads held high and without any fear, you know, mm -hmm. because we, we expect controversy from this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so in some ways we are, their voice acts as a legal representative too. You know, it's essentially mm -hmm. just our, it's our image. It's the image I don't know the brand, yeah, but that's, it's not really a brand. <laughs> I mean, because nobody's yeah, making I, money. You know? Sure. But I understand what you're saying. It's a, uh, United like, Way, so I think we'll the, umbrella, the umbrella was the, was the, was the, uh, was the good term. And, um, where, yeah. where can people, um, where can people find this and follow it online and be part of it to help it out? Um, we have a Facebook page. We are their voice with the letter R instead of, you know, A R E. Um, yep. The babysitter has a Facebook page, um, just facebook dot dot com slash the babysitter film, um, and you'll find it. Um, we have a GoFundMe, of course. Um, I think if you just look up Nathan Force Winners GoFundMe, you should find it. Um, yeah. And that's that's a, you know we're still trying to branch out. 
you know, we're taking it a step at a time. You know, Nathan's got stuff he's doing. So, you know, it, a lot of it, you know, he's not the leader, you know, but we try to let everything go through him. You know, any ideas mm-hmm. that me and Amber might have go toward, go through Nathan first. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a slow crawl, you know, sometimes, but for now, Facebook, that's where we are. That's where we we're focusing most of our time. And so far we're doing pretty good. You know, I think we've got at least 70 likes now. Yeah. Um, we've raised $165 so far. Um, so we're just trying to keep, you know, keep going, you know, keep on keeping on, you know, we're just taking it a day at a time and hoping that enough people can join us, you know, cause we really want this to be, like I said, you know, the babysitter is for everybody who's always wanted to know what the hell happened, you know, because it's nobody's ever gotten a clear answer from Victor and all for all we know, Nathan is just this, you know, some people think he's dead. I mean, you know, you Google him and, you know, people are asking, is this guy even still alive? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we want um, this to be, uh, mm-hmm. we do. Yeah. I'm just saying we want this to be you guys, you know, this is your project for whoever's listening. You know, this is you guys. Mm-hmm. Cause I was interested. Um, just when I heard about it, this is always an interesting story, but uh, I actually talk to you more interested because I do like that it delves into um, to other topics, not just the incident, um, how that affects uh, him as a person throughout his whole life. But uh, it's also fascinating that um, that you're looking, uh, you know, somewhat uh, as much as you can anyway in, into Victor's uh and not just like a, like you said or where we started. It's not like a, a witch hunt against Victor. It's uh, it's no. looking at you know what what makes what makes a, a you know molester molester, and uh, it's uh, yeah. really interesting. Something I I find really interesting, and I'm really looking forward to, and and I hope uh, hope all luck to you know to getting it made and out there. Well, thank you so much, man. We're hoping you know our target is we're going to begin production in the winter or spring. That's our target. Um, you know, you know, if all goes, you know, better than expected, we could start, you know, by January, if all does, if all goes as, you know, probably expected, where we'd have to continue to try to build up the momentum. Um, we're looking at spring, you know, April, May to start production on it right now. This is pre-production we're you know, neck deep into that. And, but I'm ready, you know, I'm very excited for this. I'm, I'm, I think Nathan is too, you know, he, yeah. he's blown away. He's blown away at the amount of support that this has gotten. And I am too, you know, this is insane. <laughs> you know, this mm-hmm. is crazy. It's just, that's the best way to put it. It's completely insane. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. I uh, really enjoyed talking to you and I know it's, uh, uh, usually it's a different kind of show. We usually we had some fun too, but um, but I thought it was, uh, something important to talk about, and I was glad uh, you came on. And I welcome you know uh, as things have progressed, you're welcome back on, and love to have Nathan on at some Absolutely. point in time if uh, if you'd be up for it. Hopefully, you know, anytime for me, anytime. And Nathan, you know, I'm sure he feels the same. It's just right. He's got sure, you know this next month. He's completely packed. But yeah. once, you know, once fall kicks around, Nathan's going to be coming out in full force. You know, he's going to be coming out and, you know, it's going to be like a, it's going to be a tornado. <laughs> Nathan is coming out. You know, just, just get through this month and he's ready. Uh, all right. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on yeah. and uh, we'll definitely talk again. Thank you, man. He's on. Cool. And I'm terribly sorry for a uh, Tuesday night, wherever, wherever you are Tuesday. We love you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> come back. Uh, come back to Neil whenever yeah, you're getting ready. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hopefully it's uh, we'll get it rescheduled uh, here. Hopefully, it's replace her with Danielle Harris mm, next time. Well, I don't. All right, Danielle on chat. Then no uh, sense to you yeah. Tuesday. I love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah all right, we we shall be back. Right, now, <laughs> thank you so much, man. Yeah, th- thank you. That was great. This is Linnea, and you're listening to Without Your Head, which I've done in a lot of movies. Have a good day and stay scared.